Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, manhunt over. Atlanta police arrest the suspected gunman behind a shooting that killed one person and hurt four others at a hospital. The hours-long search shutting down one of the busiest parts of the city. All I see was police cars and SWAT and everybody's just pulling up, pulling up, pulling up, back to back, back to back. We are in Atlanta with the latest on the investigation and what we're learning about the victims this morning. Mystery in Moscow. Ukraine is fighting back against Russian claims it tried to attack the Kremlin. Russia providing no evidence beyond these videos, saying two drones were disabled using electronic radar and no one was hurt. We'll explain what this all means for the war in Ukraine. Rising rates, the Federal Reserve hikes up the interest rate again, this time to a 16-year high. All of this happening as economic anxiety grows over recent bank failures, inflation, and the approaching debt ceiling deadline. We will take a closer look at what it means for your wallet and if we could see more rate hikes this year. Plus, flipping the script, we'll introduce you to a Broadway actor making history. Alex Newell is the first non-binary actor to be nominated for their role in a musical. Joe sat down with them about their role in the show Shucked and what it's like breaking barriers on and off the stage. And our home breaking news, we are so happy to be back together <laughs> on our show. And it feels so good. We've both been helping out with some other programming on NBC News That's now. Right. Yes. But now we're back on the morning show. We are here. If we're ever not here, it's just a quick little break <laughs> or a shoot or something like that. But we are back and we're so happy to be with you at home. We begin this morning with the arrest overnight of the suspect in that mass shooting in Atlanta. Yeah, that man is 24-year-old Dion Patterson. Police say earlier in the day he opened fire inside a hospital, killing one woman and injuring another four. The suspect the suspect then ran off, leading to an hours-long manhunt. The city was put on lockdown as police looked for him. Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock called on the Senate to take action. Thoughts and prayers are not enough. And in fact, in fact, it is a contradiction to say that you are thinking and praying and then do nothing. It, it, it is to make a mockery of prayer. The woman killed in the shooting has been identified as 39-year-old Amy St. Pierre. She worked as an employee for the CDC. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky has the latest for us this morning. Yeah, good morning. It began with a shooting inside an Atlanta hospital and then resulted in a nearly day-long manhunt that finally ended late yesterday when authorities took 24-year-old Dion Patterson into custody and booked him here into Fulton County Jail without incident. And we're learning more about what took place yesterday when authorities say Patterson walked inside Northside Hospital for an appointment, accompanied by his own mother, proceeded to the 11th floor, and that is where investigators say he pulled out a handgun and started opening fire. In this hail of bullets, we know that five women were struck, one of them fatally, as Patterson shot a handgun before fleeing that scene. Now, late last night, investigators were clear to say that the public was critical in providing updates as to his potential location. And it was actually license plate recognition cameras that recognized a car authorities believe Patterson stole from a parking garage about 20 miles away from the hospital. That helped them direct this manhunt. And when they arrived at a Cobb County condo complex, authorities say it was actually an undercover police officer who identified Patterson and they were able to move him and arrest the 24 year old without incident. Now, as for any motive in this shooting, that is still unknown at this time. Uh, his mother did share with authorities that he was on anxiety medication. We have learned that Patterson was discharged from the Coast Guard as recently as this past January, uh, but he has shared little, if anything, to authorities and as for right now, remains booked inside Fulton County Jail. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. All right, Atlanta. thank you, Morgan. For more on this, let's bring in NBC News analyst and retired ATF special agent in charge, Jim Cavanaugh. Jim, thanks for being with us this morning. Let's start with this manhunt. It was hours long. It puts this major city, Atlanta, in lockdown while they were doing it. How necessary was that to finding the suspect and trying to keep people safe? Well, I think it was critical, Savannah. I think the Atlanta PD did a good job here. They communicated with the public. They did get the picture of the suspect out from the video pretty quick. They told everybody he was loose because they picked it up on the video from the hospital. 
So they knew he'd, uh, you know, egressed the scene within just a couple of minutes of the murder and the shootings. So that was a good move, locking it down. Then they picked up the carjacking, took it to Cobb County. Very good police work, and ultimately used a plainclothes officer, an undercover officer, which which is routine business in police business yeah. to use plainclothes officers when you have violent suspects afoot because you can send them in to kind of be your eyes ahead before they see the uniformed cars or uniformed officers. You spot the fugitive or the wanted person and then you can make your move. So it was good work by Cobb County, good work by Atlanta PD and everybody concerned. But of course, it doesn't bring any of the, uh, the it doesn't bring the people who were wounded uh, back to normal or the, you know, bring us back to the person who was killed. Yeah, absolutely. Jim, you mentioned that photo that they were able to use in a press conference last night. Police had revealed that they used cameras from the transportation department to find the suspect and to have that image. First, let's listen to more of what they had to say. If you rewind the hand of time, four years, we probably would not be where we are today right now. Technology played a huge role, but technology doesn't do any good without people who are determined to capture an individual that would do something like this. And today we saw where those two things came together in an amazing way. Jim, help us understand just how important tech is becoming in dealing with mass shootings. What is this technology? What are these developments helping us be able to do? Well, just take this case, license plate readers that can be in fixed locations around uh, the city. These are extremely valuable to the police. Of course, police cars can have them as well. And when that license plate hits that reader, it kicks out the alert to the officers. It's tremendous technology. And what the chief was talking about here was a real-time crime center. Real-time crime centers, you know, uh, uh, coordinate that information. They bring other agencies together. Uh, they have a center. All that information is relayed to, you know, ranking l lieutenants and officers who can make decisions uh, for real-time unfolding violent events. Uh, you know, in the past, maybe we just had, you know, uh, dispatchers in the center. Now, in a real-time crime center, you have, you know, police officers, commanders, people who can direct people to go certain places, officers, plainclothes, SWAT, detectives. So real-time crime, as it's breaking and the violence is unfolding, the police are sitting there with the technology and they can dispatch uh, to make the city safer. That's what they did here. That's what they did in Cobb County, and that's what the chief was lauding. He was talking about how well that system worked. Many cities have these. They're very, very helpful. Jim, after a tragedy like this, of course, people wonder why would this happen? That's also one of the most difficult questions to answer, the motive. Where does the investigation go from here in terms of figuring that out just quickly? Well, I think really the investigation is really going to center mostly on his culpability, the evidence that it's him, the photographs, the witnesses, because he's going to be prosecuted for capital murder. So that's going to be the bulk of it. Motive's going to turn out that he's, you know, unhappy with his treatment or he didn't get the drugs he wanted or somehow he's mad. And, you know, he's, he's just going to be a, a person who used a gun to, uh, you know, get what he wants or, or threw his tantrum and resulted in capital murder. Uh, it's a pretty hard thing to fix. But uh, he's ruined lives, lives, and he's ruined his own. Jim Cavanaugh, thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks. This morning, Ukraine is dealing with the aftermath of another series of Russian drone attacks. Ukrainian officials say their air defenses shot down the majority of the drones that targeted Kyiv, but some did manage to land in Odessa. No casualties were reported there. It comes one day after Moscow accused Kyiv of attempting to assassinate Russian President Vladimir Putin in a drone attack on the Kremlin. Now, this video is one of several circulating on Russian social media. It appears to show an object flying toward the Kremlin roof before exploding. Moscow says the drones were disabled. There were no injuries. Ukraine's government has denied any involvement. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins us now from Kiev with the latest. So Ellison, let's walk us through what we know about this incident at the Kremlin, the reaction from both Russia and Ukraine. And we understand the Kremlin now blaming the U.S. as well, right? Yeah, I mean, a lot has happened in the last 24 hours, Joe. Ukrainian officials are adamantly denying any involvement in this alleged drone attack on the Kremlin. Russia so far has provided no evidence of this attack. The videos that you referenced, that's really all we have at this point. And those first started surfacing on social media. Uh, Ukrainian officials, they are saying, we didn't know about this. We had nothing to do with this. These are not our drones. And they're accusing Russia of essentially trying to set them up. 
up. On top of that, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says we do not have weapons to spare to even try something like this. Other officials have said, how would this possibly benefit us on the battlefield? Listen. We don't attack Putin or Moscow. Uh, we fight on, on our territory. We are defending our villages and cities. We don't have, you know, enough weapon for this. That's why we don't use it any, anywhere. For, for us, that is the deficit. We, we can't spend it. And we didn't attack Putin. And Joe, you mentioned the latest reaction we're hearing from the Kremlin. A spokesperson for President Vladimir Putin, Dmitry Peskov, was asked to respond to Kyiv's denials and also the U.S.'s pushback from the Secretary of State, who said to take anything in this situation coming from Russia with a large salt shaker. He said this in part, quote, attempts to disown this both in Kyiv and Washington are ridiculous. He went on to say Kyiv only does what it is told to do. Often even the goals themselves are not determined by Kyiv but they are determined in Washington and then brought to Kyiv so that Kyiv simply fulfills. But you now also have a third party here, a non-governmental organization siding with Ukraine. The Institute for the Study of War says it is highly unlikely that Ukraine was involved in these attacks. They say that they believe this is something that Russia likely staged internally to try and cater to a Russian domestic audience to try and further uh, make mobilizations throughout society. Society. They say one of the reasons for believing that is that Russia has uh, upped their air defense system. So they say it's highly unlikely that two drones could get to the heart of the Kremlin. Joe. So, Ellison, we're also following President Zelensky's trip to the Netherlands. We know that he's been speaking at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. What's his main message there? He is saying this court has to hold President Putin accountable. He's saying that this is a historical necessity, uh, telling the court, quote, only one institution is capable of responding to the original crime, the crime of aggression, a tribunal, not some compromise that will allow politicians to say that the case is allegedly done, but a true, uh, really true, full-fledged tribunal. He Speaking about Putin, he said that this is an individual who deserves to be sanctioned for his criminal actions here in the capital of criminal law. Joe. All right. Ellison Barber in Kiev. Ellison, thank you. Let's turn to some financial news now. There are new questions this morning about the future of the nation's economy. It comes after the Federal Reserve raised interest rates to a 16-year high yesterday. Now, this is the 10th consecutive rate hike since March 2022, all part of an effort to try to tame inflation. We remain strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. Inflation has moderated somewhat since the middle of last year. Nonetheless, inflation pressures continue to run high, and the process of getting inflation back down to 2 percent has a long way to go. Joining us for more on this is Sarah Foster. She's an analyst for Bank Rate. Hey, Sarah, good morning. Thank you for being here. So tell us, what should we know about this latest rate hike? How does this affect us right now in the short term? Absolutely. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I think as far as how this rate hike impacts us in the short term, for borrowers, it just means that interest rates are going to get a little bit higher, especially for those home equity loans, those oh HELOCs, uh, as well as you know used car loans, which, for instance, have gotten already to a 12-year high. But I think, you know, in the long term, what Powell really indicated, and I think what the biggest news from the press conference is almost what Powell, you know, didn't say, uh, Fed officials are no longer saying that they're expecting additional policy firming, which is code for more rate hikes. And so it essentially means that they're opening the door to a pause. Yeah, and I'm going to ask you more about that in just a minute in terms of what to expect going forward. First, I want to, I just mentioned, 10th consecutive rate hike since March of last year. Ultimately, that is a 5% increase in those 10 months. Tell us the wider impact that's had on our economy. What challenges has that caused for people at home? Well, the immediate uh, place that we're seeing these higher interest rates impact the economy has really been in the housing market. We've seen mm -hmm. affordability issues become an even bigger concern for Americans who are already dealing with elevated home prices. 
but then also, you know, we've already started to see the job market slow and it's indicating signs that it's losing steam. We just got a report from the Department of Labor yesterday that basically showed that uh, job openings are falling, layoffs are ticking up, even the quits rate, which has long been regarded as a sign of economic confidence, that's starting to slow. And of course, we see another look at the labor market tomorrow with the monthly jobs report. So I think what we're seeing really is a slowing economy, whether that means a recession uh, is still kind of, you know, a, a main question. Mm -hmm. Chair Powell has obviously indicated that he still isn't expecting that. Right. Yeah, it's been an open question for 10 months now. I mean, the Fed, they've been navigating a really tough economy. High inflation, which is sort of what this rate hike is supposed to try to tackle. But then also we've seen this troubled banking sector with multiple banks ultimately collapsing. And then also Washington in this deadlock over raising the debt ceiling. They have indicated, the Fed has indicated that this might have been the last rate increase, as you just mentioned a minute ago, that we'll see for a while. But what do you think we should expect going forward? Well, I think what we see for the Fed is really this new era. For the first time, they're looking for reasons not to continue raising interest rates. Before, we were in this era where the Fed was looking for continuing reasons to hike by the, you know, the traditional 25 basis points or even higher. So I think this is really signaling that the Fed is a little bit more cautious because, as they did note during the press conference, we would like to see how much tightening those three bank failures that we've gotten this year mm -hmm. will continue impacting the economy. And, of course, some estimates from economists already say that it could be the equivalent to 1.5 percentage points of extra rate hikes. Wow. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. Great. New developments this morning in connection with a series of recent stabbings in the college town of Davis, California. Police say they have detained a person of interest for questioning. Over the past five days, there have been three stabbings in the area. Two people were killed and another was injured. The civil rape case against former President Donald Trump continues today, but Trump's lawyers have revealed that they will not be calling any witnesses to the stand in his defense. The plaintiffs, on the other hand, have a lengthy list of witnesses who they prepared to bring to the stand. Mr. Trump has continuously denied the decades-old rape allegation made against him by writer E. Jean Carroll. NBC News legal analyst Danny Sabalos joins us now. So, Danny, we weren't surprised to hear that former President Trump was not going to testify, right. but the fact that the defense is calling no witnesses, what do you make of that? In a criminal case, it's not uncommon to call zero witnesses. I do it all the time in criminal cases, and that's because the burden is on the prosecution. And you can argue that in your closing. In a civil case, the burden is much lighter for the plaintiff. But yet, the defense's decision to call zero witnesses, uh, I think, is consistent with their theme that they consider this case a big nothing. That's the gambit that they've gone with. And that's why I think you saw Joe Tacopina take a very aggressive stance, a very aggressive approach in cross-examining E. Jean Carroll. They don't want the jury to think that they're treating a victim with kid gloves. They want the jury to think this person is a liar and that this case has no value. And that's why they're calling no witnesses. It's a risk. It's a gamble. Uh, but if successful, then it might work with the jury because it's consistent with their theme. They think of E. Jean Carroll as a liar and they're calling no witnesses because this is a nothing case. So as Joe mentioned, it wasn't a surprise that we didn't actually see Trump on the stand there. We also aren't seeing the witnesses, but they did hear this tape deposition. What happened there? So this is what I thought the defense was going to do from the beginning, and that is raise the specter of Donald Trump possibly coming in to testify. And when you do that, there's a strategy to that, because you keep certain members of the plaintiff's team working, burning the midnight oil, putting together their cross-examination if Donald Trump enters through those doors and takes the witness stand. You burn the other side's resources. But look. I told you this weeks ago. I don't even think this was a, a major prediction. Trump was never going to testify because the deposition transcript is a known quantity. You know what's in that transcript. There are no surprises. They can play it. And by the way, even some of the excerpts show how Donald Trump's way of, uh, let's say, mincing the English language or a answering and not answering questions the way he wants to works to his favor. In one excerpt, for example, he says something to the effect of, you know, why didn't she uh, report it right away? Look, look at how he got in a piece of evidence that is something that normally might not be admissible, but mm -hmm. that's because he answers every question the way he wants to answer it instead of answering the question asked. So that might be a little win for Trump, but still in the long haul, 
I think this is the defense's approach. They are conceding a possible loss in this case and avoiding the possible disaster of him coming in and testifying live without mm -hmm. a net. Let's talk about the prosecution strategy so far. E. Jean Carroll expected to wrap up their side today. How do you sum up the arguments they've made, and then what would we expect from them on their last day of presenting their case? If I'm E. Jean Carroll's team, I am going to focus somewhat on the plaintiff's testimony, but I don't think that was the strongest piece of evidence. They got in essentially what's called character evidence. They were lucky enough to get in evidence of other women complaining that Donald Trump had assaulted them. This is such powerful evidence that it is strictly, strictly uh, restrained by the rules of evidence. And so, huge win for the plaintiff getting this evidence in. This this is what I would focus on in the closing and the psychologist's testimony that people who are assaulted often compartmentalize it, they often hide it, they, they often do not report because they are afraid of their assailant. And boy, is there anyone you could be more afraid of in terms of influence than the then real estate magnate and future president of the United States, Donald Trump. On the defense, their theme has always been the same. This person's a liar. It's not a victim that we need to treat nicely. She's a big liar, and that's what they're going to, going to hammer over and over again in their closing. Danny Savalos, as always, we appreciate you. Time for a check on your morning news now weather forecast. Uh, that's right. That means Angie Lassman is here with us. Hi, Angie. Good morning. Hi, guys. Good morning. I got good news for you when it comes to the weekend. For a lot of folks, it's going to feel really spring lake, but we've got to get through some bumpy kind of weather over the next day or so before we get to that. And that'll specifically be centered over parts of the plains as we have a system that's going to work a little farther to the east. It does bring some rain to parts of the Rockies through the day today, but it'll also bring that potential for some strong to severe storms. Again, stretch through the plains, specifically Texas. Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, as we get into the afternoon and even evening hours tonight. By the time we get into tomorrow, we could see some more strong storms into parts of Texas and the Mississippi Valley. We'll also see some rain working through the Midwest. So a couple of things to note that might impact you for your Thursday and your Friday uh, activities. Here's your Thursday threats when it comes to severe. We're mainly looking at the potential for some large and damaging hail up to two inches in size. Uh, it will also have the potential for some strong wind gusts. Those could be up to 60 miles per hour, and we can't rule out tornadoes. And again, it expands uh, stretching from parts of Kansas through Oklahoma, including Oklahoma City, Dallas, Austin. All of those locations could see some of that larger hail. Where you see the, the brighter blue, that's where we could have the potential for the baseball size hail. So if you live in some of these places, something to note and stay connected about here through the afternoon hours, because we likely could see some of these alerts coming down into the afternoon and even into the evening too. By the time we get into tomorrow, you see the two areas that we're watching. I mentioned part of Texas and as well as the Mississippi Valley. Tomorrow, the tornado threat is low, but the hail threat will still be there, as well as the, the wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour. When we're talking hail, it's mainly going to be just south of Fort Worth, but including places like Waco, Hamilton, Brady. So again, another day for Texas to watch for some severe weather into your Friday. Rain-wise, it's not all that impressive, but we could see anywhere from an inch to maybe isolated amounts higher than that in places like Fayetteville, up through North Platte, as well as this system makes its way to the east. And here's the good news. And it's, it's not today's weather or today's temperatures, I should say, but it's what happens over the coming days because we once again are going to be chilly in New York. 59 degrees today, 57 for Pittsburgh, 64 for Detroit. These numbers are well below normal for this time of year. And even tomorrow, we only see slight improvements in a lot of spots. Boston at 53 degrees. New York finally makes it into the low 60s. But check out this weekend. Just in time for Saturday, we're going to be into the high 60s in New York. We'll end up into the low 70s for Washington, D.C. And we're near 80 by the time we get into our next work week in D.C. Meanwhile, Cincinnati, you guys are going to end up at 80 degrees on Sunday. So it'll be some more spring-like conditions. That omega block that we've been talking about all week long has finally, is going to finally start to deteriorate and loosen up. And we'll have some nicer conditions, milder conditions across the Northeast and the Midwest in the coming days, guys. Just in time for the weekend. Oh, I was just going to say, coming days, this weekend. <laughs> there we go, Angie. We've, we already have made brunch plans yeah. for this weekend. <laughs> yes, yes, so exactly. Thanks, I'll Andy. <laughs> all right, coming up, several Texas cities declare states of emergency just one week before COVID border restrictions are lifted. We'll take you to one of those cities next where migrants are already camped out and officials warn it's about to get worse. You're watching Morning News now. Welcome back. Concerns are growing this morning about a potential crisis on the southern border. Just a week from now, immigration COVID restrictions are set to be lifted and officials are bracing for an influx of migrants. The Biden administration is sending hundreds of troops to help with that surge. But some people in those states say that is not enough. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has more. 
The Biden administration is touting a new deal with Mexico that will allow U.S. authorities to deport migrants from certain countries back across the border. But all this comes as migrant advocates here say there is a humanitarian crisis at the border. At dawn, the migrants covered in blankets stretch for blocks. El Paso is under a state of emergency because city officials say they don't have enough resources to handle this. Are you desperate? I'm very desperate. Maria Angel from Venezuela tells us, next to her 10-year-old daughter, I don't have anything to eat. I don't have anywhere to sleep, she says. We saw that desperation as migrants here scrambled for food and water. We were here several months ago, and there appear to be many more migrants now. The difference is striking. This group extends all the way around this church for several city blocks. And from Texas to Arizona to California, some border officials expect the daily flow of migrants will double when the COVID border restriction known as Title 42 is lifted. President Biden under pressure. Republicans arguing his lax border policies spark the record number of illegal border crossings, while migrant advocates say his upcoming deployment of 1,500 active duty troops to help Border Patrol with administrative duties sends the wrong message. Why not send 1,500 attorneys? That's the necessity here. Why not send 1,500 social workers? Other critics here say the troops are too little, too late. I have lived here for over 38 years, and I've never seen anything like this in El Paso. Claudia Rodriguez is a business owner in El Paso who does not think the White House has done enough to prepare for the lifting of Title 42. We have people sleeping on our streets. This is unsustainable. It's not normal. Please help us, and enough with the politics of it. Our thanks to Gabe Gutierrez for that report. And the Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, is making a trip to the southern border today and is asking Congress to step in to help solve the immigration issue. Let's take a look at what else is making headlines around the world this morning, starting with an update on a deadly school shooting in Serbia. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio. Savannah Joe, good morning. Yes, Serbia is in shock after a 13-year-old opened fire at his school, killing eight of his fellow children and the school guard. Now, the police say the student meticulously planned the attack. He drew sketches of the classrooms and made a list of people to target. A teacher and six other children were injured and hospitalized, two of them in serious condition. Now, let's go to Sudan, where the United Nations humanitarian chief arrived on Wednesday at the country's main seaport. He will try to secure safe passage of much-needed aid as the ongoing fighting between two generals led to a serious humanitarian crisis. Since the start of the fighting, thousands of UN workers were evacuated and hundreds of metric tons of food has been looted. Hundreds of thousands of people who've been displaced are in urgent need of aid. And back to this part of the world, take a look at this. It's a bridal chariot from Pompeii, restored back to its former glory. Discovered, discovered three years ago under 13 feet of volcanic ash, the four-wheeled chariot features silver and bronze decorations, including some of erotic scenes. It's the star piece in a new exhibition here in Rome, which uh, invites viewers to reflect on today's connections with classical Roman and Greek civilizations. Guys, a uh, bridal chariot with erotic scenes decorations. Sounds like there was some sort of Playboy mansion in Pompeii back in the days. It, it had to start somewhere, Claudio. So. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Exactly. Thanks, Claudio. Well, now we're all awake. Coming up on Morning News Now, a medical breakthrough in the battle against a serious respiratory virus. The FDA has approved the world's first RSV vaccine in hopes of preventing thousands of cases of the virus every year. We're going to tell you how it works and when it could be rolled out. Stay with us. We are back with a breakthrough in the fight against the common respiratory virus, RSV. Yeah, this is pretty exciting. The FDA just approved the world's first RSV vaccine. Pharmaceutical giant GSK developed the shot, which is meant for adults age 60 and up. Researchers say this development is 60 years in the making. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins us now with more on the vaccine. Dr. John, good to have you with us. So first of all, what more do we need to know about this vaccine? How does it work? Any side effects? 
And good morning in Savannah. You're right. This is exciting. And the reason it's exciting is because of the impact that RSV makes on us. And I think a lot of us realize that children get hospitalized with RSV, one mm -hmm. to 300 die a year, but might not realize that six to 10,000 older adults also die a year from RSV. And that's what this vaccine is targeting. Just got FDA approval. It's a Glasgow Smith Klein vaccine. It's protein based. And what's happening right now, we're finding out from their clinical trials, is it reduces symptomatic illness by 83%. In other words, not getting sick by 83%. Reduces severe illness by 94%. So it's very effective. As far as safety, it's the typical symptoms that we saw with other things sore arm, fatigue, muscle aches, those types of things. There was a case of Guillain Barre. They're not necessarily, they don't know if this is necessarily associated with the vaccine, but they're certainly looking into it and they'll continue to do that as time goes on. But having this vaccine here is going to be important to keep this RSV virus under control. So, doctor, when could people actually start getting this? What's next? Well, now that's FDA approved, they should be starting to get it fairly soon because the manufacturers have already started to manufacture it, just needs to get to the distribution point. So I would be surprised if you're not getting this by the end of the month. Now, one thing about RSV, it tends to be seasonal, so that tends to be more of a winter-type illness. So doctors might be recommending them getting it later in the summer, early in the fall, to protect them during those, early, those seasons of RSV. So, Dr. John, Pfizer is also developing an RSV vaccine for older adults. Where is that vaccine in the process, including the approval process? Yes. So Pfizer's vaccine is just a little bit behind, and they think the approval will come later this month, and they're looking at theirs as well. They went and looked at for FDA approval, but the FDA said they needed a little bit more data, and so they're submitting that more data. Uh, the concern there is that they didn't get enough adults the first time, and so they will have enough this time, and they think FDA approval will be by the end of the month. On top of that, we're looking at other vaccines that, in addition to GSK and, and Pfizer for these older adults, looking at younger adults, looking at children, and particularly looking at pregnant women, because if they get vaccinated, Vaccinated, then their children for at least the first few months of their life will be protected before they can get vaccines if those do come later this year. Dr. Torres, before we let you go, I do want to switch gears here and ask you about some other medical news. It seems also potentially exciting, but I know there's some things we need to learn here. A clinical trial of Eli Lilly's new Alzheimer's treatment, it showed it significantly slowed the progression of the disease. Welcome news for so many families. I do know, though, that it also carried some risks. What do we need to know about this? So the main thing is it's, it's called denonimab. It's a drug, drug out there that showed a 35% slowing of cognitive decline over 18 months compared to those who had placebos. One of the concerns is there were a limited number of adults in there, and like most other medications that target Alzheimer's, we're not sure how long it's going to work in the, wrong, in the long run, and side effects you know, tend to be focusing on the brain for these older adults. And so for some, they're saying it could be a great drug. For others, they're saying, you know, look at it, that, weigh that risk benefit behind it. But we're making steps forward on these Alzheimer's drugs and treatments, which is extremely important for this one disease that we're having such a hard time mm -hmm. figuring out how to take care of. Absolutely. Dr. John Torres, thank you so much. Great to have you with us. Coming up, we are seeing more and more examples of artificial intelligence in our everyday lives. So now the White House is trying to address that. A little more on the big tech companies that are being called to Washington to answer questions about the AI boom. Next. Also this morning, move over Twitter. A lot of users are jumping ship to a new social media site. Look at this. Oh, no, that's actually Twitter. Well, this one looks very similar to Twitter. We'll explain the buzz behind Blue Sky is what it's called and just how much it's taking off. That is in just a few minutes. Stay with us. Welcome back. There are growing concerns about the future of artificial intelligence and the impact it could have on all of us. That is right. And that's why chief executives of four of the top companies involved in creating AI products are being called to the White House for a big meeting today with the Biden administration. NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now with more on this. Hey, Ali, I mean, this feels like this is a long time coming. There have been so many calls for something like this, even from within side the industry. And I know Vice President Kamala Harris is going to be leading this meeting. Who's going to be there and what are they focusing on? Yeah, Savannah and Joe, good morning. This meeting, as you mentioned, is going to be led by Vice President Kamala Harris, and it will include uh, the CEOs of these top AI companies, companies like Alphabet, Anthropic, uh, OpenAI, and Microsoft, all companies with chatbots that have taken the lead in this new technology that's frankly uh, still new and sub in some cases pretty scary to mm -hmm. most Americans. And the White House is saying this is all in an effort, not necessarily uh, to have some outright regulation of this 
this industry, but rather uh, to put in practice the safety measures before this is widely available to the public. They want this to be uh, ethically safe, practically safe before most Americans uh, have access to it, because we've seen this technology grow more and more popular over the last uh, few years, as you're familiar with. We've seen it uh, in education, in law enforcement. We know that the writers in Hollywood are now uh, striking uh, uh, to limit the use of AI. And we even see it in politics now. We saw a, a 2024 RNC ad uh, released shortly after the president's re-election announcement that was uh, created with the use of AI. So this is the White House putting its power uh, behind the regulation and the safety of this technology uh, before it could uh, become even more widespread. So, Ali, the White House has been working to address this issue in October. It released what's being called a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. So tell us, what is that and how is it different from any legislation on AI? That's right. So b b barring any sort of federal legislation that the White House uh, could champion, we, which is already being called for in Congress, there's a framework of uh, some legislation flo floating around Congress right now. As you mentioned, the White House in October released this Bill of Rights that essentially uh, lets Americans know what they're entitled to. It talks about the safe use of AI, the prevention of discrimination, the privacy and protection of Americans' data. But to help put those pledges into practice, the White White House today is announcing several other pledges. They're, they're announcing uh, the use of $140 million in funding that's going to go to seven new AI uh, research institutes that would uh, that would uh, grow the number to a total of 25 in this country. It's also announcing that there's going to be this independent exercise at uh, this hacker conference in August that will be let the Biden administration be able to see how well those uh those uh, bullets in that Bill of Rights are being put into practice, how well they're being used. Uh, in this summer, the Office of Management and Budget is also going to release a draft of exactly how the federal government is using these AI uh, efforts and these practical uh, ethics efforts to open it up for public comment to see how Americans want that to be changed or, uh, or, cha or altered in any way. Uh, so this is all an effort by the White House uh, to get ahead of this technology that's uh, rapidly evolving and advancing that uh, I know you guys are aware of because you cover it on this show. So uh, definitely an effort by the White House to get ahead of that. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much going on. It is pretty freaky. In fact, a Google executive, you mentioned Alphabet, that's the parent company of Google who will be there. They even stepped down last week with the sort of known in the industry as the godfather of AI, just so that he could speak out about the dangers. It's wow. really some scary stuff. Ali, thank you very much for your reporting here. Now to a social media platform that is creating a lot of buzz as an alternative to Twitter. It is called Blue Sky and has earned the nickname Twitter 2.0 because of its similarities to the social media app. Some high profile Twitter users are making the jump that includes politicians like New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and celebrities like Chrissy Teigen. But not just anyone gets to join this app. You actually need an invite to create an account. NBC News youth and Internet culture reporter Callan Rosenblatt joins us now with everything we need to know. So, Callan, tell us why is Blue Sky becoming so popular over the last month and how do you get that invite? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Joe and Savannah. Well, part of the reason that Blue Sky is so popular is because of that invite. This exclusivity and this platform that is just emerging has been, you know, one of the factors why people are so interested in getting onto it. Uh, Blue Sky is a decentralized social media network. It actually began as a project at Twitter and then became independent from Twitter, which is why it shares so much DNA. The platform at this time, which is in beta, it's in its very early stages, does look a lot like Twitter, but it is missing a few components because, like, as I mentioned, it's in its very early stages. Right now, if you're looking for an invite, the best way to get one is to beg your friends who are on Blue Sky. It is impossible, it feels like, to get an invite, and you're huh. very lucky once you do snag one. They're very, very limited at this time. Interesting. And, Callan, what are some of the major differences between the two apps? For people who have used Twitter for years now, what's the difference here with Blue Sky? Well, as I mentioned, when you open it, it's going to look very similar, but it's still missing components because of that beta nature. It is missing things like direct messaging. Um, at this time, as I understand it, you can't block anyone. You can mute threads, but you can't block them quite yet. You can't share video quite yet. And then there are other features on um, on Twitter that are like relatively recent, I believe, like super follows where you can pay someone to follow them or even like bookmarking, I believe, are still features that don't exist on Blue Sky yet. 
But as I mentioned, Blue Sky's in its really early phases. This is still a beta. This is still being tested out. It, they're still working out the bugs. And that's yeah. also why it's so exclusive, too. They want to make sure that the platform can handle the influx of people, can make sure it's safe mm. for marginalized groups who are some of the first users of Blue Sky before they open it up to the public. So, Callan, with all that buzz right now, is it possible that Blue Sky could become a legitimate competitor for Twitter? I mean, clearly with the invite thing, they're not super concerned about rapid growth right now. Yes, Joe, I, I think they've even experienced rapid growth for them, you know, what they consider to be rapid growth. But I do think that there are people out there who consider this a legitimate alternative or a possibility to a legitimate alternative. I, you know, I keep saying it's in its very early stages, so we still have a little time to see how this pans out. But people are really excited about this platform. You know, in a, in a post Elon Musk takeover, people have felt that Twitter has become very chaotic and a little unreliable. And so they're kind of looking for this Twitter alternative. They feel like this is the first platform, you know, there's been a lot like Mastodon or uh, Spoutable mm. that they're, you know, a little iffy about that aren't bad. They're just not the perfect Twitter alternative. This is one that a lot of people feel could be potentially the real true Twitter alternative. Hmm. If people are nicer on Blue Sky, then I'm all for it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little crazy over on Twitter lately. Right. Yeah. Dally. Callan, did somebody have a birthday today, yesterday? Is it your birthday? It was my birthday yesterday. Oh, yay. Happy, Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you get a Blue Sky invite yeah. for your birthday present. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I got one. That was the best birthday oh, present. Good. Oh, thank good. You. Of course you did. <laughs> All right. All right. Cal, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, let's take a look at what else is making financial headlines this morning. More tough news for regional banks here in the U.S. in the wake of First Republic's collapse. That's right. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and more. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. It is great to say that. I am so happy you guys are back. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good to see you. Okay, let, let's give you some business headlines. Regional banks are under pressure again, and this just days after First Republic became the third lender to collapse since March. Shares of PacWest, which is based in Beverly Hills, losing more than a third of their value on reports. It's looking at all options, including a sale. Now, the sector has been hit hard by the Federal Reserve's rate hikes over the past year, and that's pushed up yield on Treasury bonds hitting the value of their deposits. Banks with high levels of uninsured deposits or riskier loans have seen a run on deposits. And PacWest says it's in talks with investors and it's seen a rise in deposits. Ford is reportedly facing another production snag with the popular F-150 pickup trucks. This time it's due to missing door handles. Sources say the automaker is working to resolve the issue with some vehicles being parked until the handles can be installed and some shipments are being delayed. Now, in a statement to Reuters, Ford says it does expect to make up all of the production that's being impacted. Ford temporarily halted work at three North American plants over the weekend where it makes both gas and electric versions of the F-150. And olive oil prices are at record levels and could stay elevated for a while. This is from data from the IMF, which shows global prices have hit nearly $6,000 per metric ton. Now, a prolonged drought in Spain, which is the world's top olive oil producer, is the biggest reason behind the spike. And demand has been strong in recent years as consumers are eating and cooking more at home during and after the pandemic. A shortage of sunflower oil following Russia's invasion of Ukraine is also driving up prices. Mm. So everything's more expensive, now olive oil. You know, I, I know, right? I've been cooking a lot more at home and Me I've been too? told yeah. I use too much olive oil oh, yeah. in my yes. cooking. So. The olive oil is really good, it's so exactly. good. All right. Is that Peter's review? Yes. <laughs> Less. We're going to use less. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, coming up on Morning News Now, making history on the Great White Way. This week's Tony nominations included a lot of firsts, including one of two actors to become the first non-binary actors nominated for their role. My conversation with Alex Newell from the musical Shucked is next on their journey from Glee to the big stage. Welcome back. We are celebrating our friend Al Roker today after he was inducted into the Broadcasting and Cable Hall of Fame. The Today co-host attended the ceremony last night with a bunch of our other NBC News colleagues. True to form, Al praised his family, mentors, and co-workers in his speech, calling the honor a full circle moment. And listen to this. It's so cool. He was inducted alongside his wife, Deborah Roberts, also inducted last night. Congratulations to Al and Deborah. Al is just one of the best people you'll ever meet on air, off air. He's the best. Congratulations to Al. 
Now to our series, Flipping the Script, featuring people on stage, on screen, and behind the scenes shining a spotlight on diversity. Enter Alex Newell, who rose to stardom on the show Glee, later earning raves for their turn in Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Well, now Newell is on Broadway playing Lulu in the musical Shucked. On Tuesday, Newell made history when they were nominated for a Tony Award in the category Featured Actor in a Musical. We spoke with Alex shortly before the nominations came out. This court ain't gonna shock itself. When you tell people the name of the show, uh -huh. I'm guessing you might have to repeat it a couple times sometime for people, right? If I say it in a southern accent, I only have to say it once. Shucked. And they get it. And they all say it like corn. I'm just like, exactly, love. What is shucked about? Corn. It's about corn. How do people react when you say this is a this is Just a musical like about corn? <laughs> you smiled and nodded, <laughs> and you're like, this person is crazy. I read the script and I fell in love with it because it was that it was shocking. It was shocking that this so unassuming show, based off of something years ago before I was born, had so much heart and had such like the visceral of being about corn. You're saying you were shocked by shock? I was shocked by shock. And Alex Newell shocked. And Alex Newell may have been shocked again this week, making history along with Jay Harrison G as the first non-binary actors nominated for Tonys. When I started my career all those years ago, there was no vernacular. There was no vocabulary for this. There was no non-binary. There was no gender non-conforming. There was no gender queer. There was, there was no vernacular. I've always said that my pronouns are personal to me and I accept all of them. It's for me, I just say it with respect. This all raises an issue that I'm sure you become familiar with, which is award shows there are tend, awards to go, <laughs> tend to go actor and uh -huh. actress. Yes. With the Tonys, what do you do about that? Well, I, being the thespian and actor that I've been, I've always deemed actor as a gender neutral term because technically it is. It, you do the art of acting, you are then an actor. Um, we created gender, gendered categories because it was a white male dominated field and women weren't winning anything. This came up with an actor from Anne Juliet who's non-binary and plays a non-binary character and just said, you know what, I'm just not gonna enter yeah. because I don't feel this is the right fit for me right Which is now. respectable. It is truly one of the most selfless, respectable things that one person could do. Do you hope it prompts some sort of change? It has to. I mean, we're, it, it, we're too deep. We're knees deep in the, as Lucille Ball would be making wine. We're too deep to not have impactful change because what we're doing, we're closing great, talented people out. What do you think the answer is? Or is it a hard answer? It's a hard answer. That's like saying that, is it blue or cerulean? I don't know. <laughs> but I know that there has to be an actual conversation around it all because what we also don't want to do is to go backwards. There's worlds right now where lawmakers are passing these bills that target the trans community, that target drag queens, that target the LGBTQ community. And then there's also this world right here where you get a standing ovation yeah. every night and the LGBTQ community is embraced. Do, how do we reconcile those two worlds because in some ways we're living in two very different places because right? we are living in two different places you know people's first reaction to something that they don't understand or they can't grab is is hatred and sometimes hate just fuels so much more emotions and rallies people together more if we focus that with just love and compassion and care i think we'd be in such a better place what role does art and musicals like this play in changing inspiration education, holding up a mirror directly to someone's face and saying, this is you, hey, that ugly thing that you didn't like, that's you. Now, what would you rather, look in the mirror and find something that you love? Most people would, but sometimes art and life, it needs a great mirror to show you something's wrong in your life and it doesn't have to be that way. As far as Shucked goes, what do you hope people get out of it? Like, I know it is about corn. Puns and about <laughs> corn, but there's deeper stuff there, right? There is. It's about community and connection and family and love. And, you know, I want everyone to, one, leave here in such a joyous manner. And if you can come to this theater for 2.30, <laughs> two hours and 30 minutes, and just laugh and take those jokes and those puns out into the world and just remember that good time. And learn the lesson of how strong your community is and who to lean on and how you can lean on them. That's also a brilliant thing. <laughs>
voice. You can catch Alex uh, in Shock Returned, nine Tony <laughs> nominations on Broadway now. I want to see it. Let's yes, go. It is great. You got, you're got. you so funny. Oh, my puns, gosh. What a great puns, interview, puns, as always. Thank love you, this. Love, love, love flipping the script. But that All was right. so great. Thank you. Appreciate that. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. Uh, the news continues right now. Stay with us. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, captured a tense hours-long manhunt in Atlanta coming to a dramatic close overnight. Atlanta police arrested a 24-year-old suspect who's accused of opening fire in a medical facility waiting room, killing one, injuring four others. Well, the latest on the attack, including how the suspect was tracked down and the search for a motive. Escalation overseas. Ukraine's President Zelensky is denying his country had anything to do with what Russia says was a drone attack on the Kremlin, claiming without any evidence it was an attempt to assassinate President Vladimir Putin. Our Richard Engel has the latest on this war of words. Also this morning, a seismic shift in America's nutrition industry. Jenny Craig, once a weight loss titan, announces it'll be closing its doors after four decades in the business. Behind the changing tide, the soaring popularity of a new class of weight loss drugs. Now, some other well-known companies are racing to keep up. And now and then, later in the hour, we'll take a trip to the past, 70 years to be exact, a closer look at the pomp and elegance of Queen Elizabeth's coronation and how that might compare to King Charles' more toned-down affair this weekend. Just a couple days away from that exciting event. You're going to get up early on Saturday morning <laughs> yeah, to watch? There we go, <laughs> Or baby. just set the DVR. <laughs> I can't believe it's already time. I it know. Like we've been it's, talking about it for a long time. It's time. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Well, more on that a little later this hour. We are going to begin this hour with the arrest overnight in connection with the deadly mass shooting yesterday in Atlanta. Yeah, the suspected gunman was arrested late last night after leading police on a manhunt, even outside of city limits. The shooting at a medical facility yesterday left one person dead and four others injured. Investigators are are now searching for a motive. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky is in Atlanta with the latest. Yeah, good morning. And after that manhunt that lasted the better part of Wednesday, this is where authorities finally brought 24-year-old Dion Patterson, the man accused of opening fire inside an Atlanta hospital. This morning, his motive is still unknown. But police say he is the sole man they believed walked inside to an 11th floor waiting room and opened fire. This morning, an Atlanta gunman no longer on the run. This video capturing the moment police caught up with Dion Patterson. The 24-year-old authorities say unleashed a deadly rampage in a hospital, launching a massive, nearly day-long manhunt. An undercover officer was the one that originally saw and confronted this individual. Police arresting Patterson after Wednesday's attack at Atlanta's Northside Hospital, where investigators say he pulled out a handgun and started shooting. They're now advising the active shooter, person shot. The violence scene playing out in an 11th floor waiting room, where police say Patterson fired a hail of bullets, killing one victim. Identified as 39-year-old Amy St. Pierre, a CDC employee. Four other women were also injured. According to police, Patterson was with his mother for an unknown medical appointment, but she was not hurt during the shooting. The active shooter call placed the bustling area on lockdown, which impacted several schools, including one attended by Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock's children. There, there, I'm here. Hoping and praying that they are safe. But the truth is none of us is safe. Barely 30 minutes after opening fire, license plate recognition cameras spotted a vehicle the shooter stole 20 miles away, near Truist Park, where the Atlanta Braves play. Those cameras proved extremely helpful today. That is where we got the precise location of the building that he walked into. Patterson, a former member of the U.S. Coast Guard, had been discharged from active duty in January after nearly five years of service. Today, the motive for the shooting remains unclear. Authorities only saying they don't believe any of the victims were targeted. This was a horrible act of gun violence. But equally horrifying is that we know that this is not unique in our country. 
And this morning we've learned that Patterson was originally showing up to Northside Hospital for an appointment of his own, uh, accompanied by his mother again, who was not injured in this shooting. As for whether or not he had any sort of criminal history, Atlanta police have only said that they have had minimal contact with this 24-year-old over the past several years. We'll send it back to you. All right, Morgan Chesky, thank you very much. Now to the growing crisis at the southern border with the Secretary of Homeland Security expected to visit the area today. That trip comes just a week before the COVID era border restriction Title 42 is set to be lifted and cities along the southern border in Texas are already seeing a surge in migrant crossings. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now with the latest. Gabe, good morning. Joe, good morning. We're here in Juarez, Mexico, just across the border from El Paso, Texas. And this is what U.S. Border Patrol, uh, Border Patrol officials say they are closely watching. Hundreds, if not thousands of migrants that have gathered here in Mexico. As you mentioned, just days before that COVID-era border restriction known as, known as Title 42 is set to be lifted. And now the Biden administration is defending its response. <laughs> This morning, migrants in El Paso are scrambling for supplies, the city under a state of emergency. But we have people sleeping on our streets. This is unsustainable. It's not normal. Please help us and enough with the politics of it. This woman from Venezuela spent the night under a blanket with her 10-year-old daughter. Are you desperate? I'm very desperate, she tells us. I don't have anything to eat. The group of migrants is huge, not just surrounding this church, but stretching across several city blocks. With Border Patrol officials from Texas to Arizona to California now warning of a new influx of migrants next week when a COVID-era border restriction known as Title 42 is lifted, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is set to visit the region today. The Biden administration also touting a new deal that will allow U.S. authorities to accept up to 100,000 people from these countries who have family in the U.S., while also deporting migrants from these other countries to Mexico. Our two countries are committed to working together uh, and uh, to address our regional migration challenge. But the White House is facing bipartisan criticism for its decision this week to deploy 1,500 active duty troops to the border. Democratic Senator Bob Menendez calling it unacceptable, while Republicans say it's too little, too late. They can't actually even enforce the immigration law. So this is a, a symbolic move that has zero meaning. Meanwhile, busloads of migrants sent by Texas Governor Greg Abbott keep arriving in northern cities like Chicago and New York, stretching shelters there. If people, especially families with children, end up sleeping in the street, which we have been working really hard to avoid, this will be on the federal government because they have not, till this day, intervened. And again, U.S. Border, Patrol's, Border Patrol officials are watching what's going on here in Mexico just days of Title 40 before Title 42 is lifted. And Joe, just beyond this fence is that migrant detention center that caught fire in late March, killing 40 people. Yet another sign of just how dangerous this humanitarian crisis at the border has become. Joe. All right. Gabe Gutierrez reporting from Juarez. Gabe, thank you. Well, as migrants cross the border, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has started busing migrants to sanctuary cities again. Busloads of asylum seekers arrived here in New York City over the past two days, and more are expected this morning. The head of the city's Office of Immigrant Affairs says it's putting a strain on resources. We're running out of hotel space. We're running out of space where we can shelter and adequately support asylum seekers. We are at the height of tourism season in New York. Uh, so hotels are running out of space. NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis is outside Port Authority Terminal where those buses have been arriving. She's on this breaking story for us. Good morning. So how are they preparing for this latest arrival and how is the state of New York helping out here with resources? Uh, good morning, Savannah. It's right behind me, uh, the street down there across the street, where the expectation is there be more busloads of migrants arriving here. According to the mayor's office, some 59,000 migrants have been bused here since last spring. And they think, as you've been pointing out, 
when Title 42 lifts, that number will increase. Mm -hmm. The mayor is saying they're in a emergency, in a crisis situation, and that's also echoed by the governor of New York. Take a listen. This is going to just add to a crisis situation that has existed for a long time, and I'm supporting the mayor in our efforts to address this. What I've done is a billion dollars in our budget to provide primarily assistance for sheltering individuals, emergency shelters. So both the governor and the mayor are seeing, saying this city needs more help. While it is a sanctuary city, they say it has not been identified like some of the border cities for extra assistance that the border cities get to accommodate migrants. And that this city literally is running out of space to house them. Savannah? So let's talk a little bit about some of the back and forth we've seen here. We've seen New York City Mayor Eric Adams call out Governor Abbott, Governor of Texas, for busing migrants to these northern cities, specifically accusing Abbott of using the situation at the border to target black mayors. What can you tell us about that and then tell us about Governor Abbott's response? Yeah, uh, uh, Mayor Adams, the mayor of New York City, he made that what has now become in some sense a controversial statement because mm -hmm. some have identified as him saying uh, he, he was calling the governor of Texas racist and Mayor Adams says that's not what he says. He, he said he is just pointing out a fact, a reality that he's black, some other big city mayors are black and that's where the governor is busing these people to. But Governor Abbott had his own response to this. We've got a full screen of it. Let me just read it to you. And he said, Mayor Adams, along with Mayor Bowser, Mayor Lightfoot, and Mayor Kenny, was proud to tout their self-declared sanctuary city status until Texas began busing migrants to New York City, Washington, D.C., Chicago, and Philadelphia to provide relief to our overrun and overwhelmed border communities. Now, that's according to the governor of Texas is his office. So essentially, the governor of Texas is saying you can't have it both ways, and he wants to put some of the pressure on New York City and other northern cities. Savannah? Yeah, and again, this all coming before Title 42 expires next week, and we expect to see even more of a surge. Rahama Ellis, thank you very much. Great reporting. There is new information this morning about that mass shooting in Texas and the days-long manhunt that followed. This morning, the suspect accused of killing five of his neighbors is under arrest, and he's not the only one facing charges. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us from Cold Spring, Texas with the latest. Sam, good morning. Joe, good morning. We are a day and a half now removed from the arrest, and yet the story at this point is that the net is continuing to widen. Three people are behind bars right now, Joe. Obviously, the suspect who was found hiding in a closet is facing five counts of murder, but in addition to that, his wife and an associate of some kind, we're still trying to understand what that connection is, they are also wanted by authorities, are facing charges right now for allowing him, they say, to elude capture for days. After the frantic chase to capture Francisco Oropesa, the wheels of justice are now in motion. Charges coming quickly for the man authorities say was at the center of the massacre and manhunt. He was charged with five counts of murder. Oropesa being held on a seven and a half million dollar bond. The justice of the peace who oversaw it taking the rare step of talking to the media. This is by far the worst case that I'm personally familiar with. It's a sad commentary on human society. But the fallout extends to others, including Oropesa's wife. You are charged with hindering the uh, apprehension of a fugitive. Divi Mara Nava appearing in court, facing between two and ten years in prison if found guilty. What we believe that Ms. Nava was doing is that she was providing him with material aid and encouragement, uh, food, clothes, uh, and had uh, and had. Uh, arranged transport to this house. A phone tip to the FBI led investigators to a home where they found Oropesa hiding under a pile of laundry. His wife allegedly telling investigators that her husband arrived at the house around 1 a.m. Tuesday and that she got him donuts and delivered a message to his cousins asking for help getting to Mexico, which she says they rejected. But authorities say Nava may have been helping both sides. Miss Nava appeared to be cooperating up until the time when we arrested her. Police still won't say who owned the house where Oropesa was captured. Um, the house is connected. Can you confirm it's a sister's house? I'm not going to say anything about that right now. 
Law enforcement also defending the amount of time it took them to respond to the murders, citing backcountry roads in severe disrepair and limited staffing. Neighbors now sleeping easier after days of living in fear. You think that you come to your home, that's your safe place, and then you find out that there's somebody across the street that killed some people. It's, it's pretty scary. All eyes now are on an indictment, Joe. The DA here in San Jacinto County telling me there is a whole lot of material to get through. They have some 250 plus law enforcement officials, all of whom to some degree have testimonials, evidence and body camera that's got to go be dissected. So what the expe expectation at this point is it's going to be a 90 day mark sometime in the next three months where that information actually gets presented to a grand jury. Joe. All right, Sam, thank you so much. This morning, Moscow is blaming the United States for yesterday's alleged drone attack on the Kremlin. The Russians also accused Ukraine of attempting to assassinate President Putin in the attack, allegations that Kyiv denies. Videos appeared on Russian social media, appearing to show the moment an aerial object exploded over the Kremlin. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has the latest. The Kremlin is now accusing Washington of coordinating with Kyiv to carry out this alleged drone attack. U.S. officials say the United States was not involved and had no advanced knowledge. The Kremlin says the Ukrainian government sent this small drone and another to assassinate President Vladimir Putin. The alleged attempt thwarted when the drones were destroyed by the Kremlin's radar defenses. Putin wasn't in the Kremlin or Moscow. Russia responded with fury and outrage, saying the Russian side reserves the right to take retaliatory measures where and when it sees fit. Others went further. Former President and Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev saying Moscow has no options except the physical elimination of Zelensky and his clique. Ukraine denied any involvement, accusing the Kremlin of staging the attack to gain public support for a failing war. President Zelensky was in Finland at the time. We don't attack Putin or Moscow. Uh, we fight on, on our territory. U.S. officials are still investigating and urge caution. The way the video spread across the Internet was unusual, suggesting a coordinated rollout instead of a traditional viral spread. The first video showing aftermath emerged on Telegram, an encrypted app popular in Russia at 2.37 a.m. Moscow time Wednesday. Then... Nothing for 12 hours, until 3 p.m., when several videos emerged also on Telegram showing the alleged attack before and after it took place. One video appears to have been recorded from a security camera. A reflection seems to show people in an office filming the screen. Two people can also be seen climbing up a staircase at the Kremlin and appear to react to an explosion. It's unclear what they were doing on the Kremlin roof in the middle of the night. A spokesman for President Putin was vague about how Russia might respond, saying only the response would be balanced and thought out. All right, Richard, thank you. And turning now to here in New York, where outrage is growing over the death of 30-year-old Jordan Neely. The homeless man died on the subway Monday afternoon after another rider held him in a chokehold for several minutes. Now, witnesses say Neely was being aggressive on the train before the incident occurred. This was the scene yesterday at that subway station where he was killed. Dozens of protesters packed the platform to demand justice for Neely. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now with more on this. Stephanie, good morning. Hi, guys. Good morning. You know, this incident happened on Monday, but scrutiny has continued to grow as the video circulated this week. And yesterday, Jordan Neely's death was ruled a homicide. And we should warn you, this video is disturbing. This morning, there is growing outrage and questions surrounding the death of a man on a New York City subway. This video obtained by NBC New York shows three subway riders subduing the 30-year-old man and one putting him in a chokehold. He later goes limp. The medical examiner ruled the death a homicide and says the cause was, quote, compression of neck, chokehold. The district attorney identified the man as Jordan Neely. A witness says that Neely got on the subway and began, quote, a somewhat aggressive speech, saying he was hungry, he was thirsty, that he didn't care about anything. He didn't care about going to jail. He didn't care that he gets a big life sentence. 
Police telling NBC News, quote, the 30-year-old male was engaged in a verbal dispute with a 24-year-old male, which subsequently escalated into a physical altercation. During a physical struggle between the two males, the 30-year-old male lost consciousness. Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine writing that Neely was a subway entertainer who performed dance routines in costume as Michael Jackson. Levine adding, he always made people smile. Our broken mental health system failed him. He deserved help, not to die in a chokehold on the floor of the subway. Police say the 24-year-old rider who put Neely into the chokehold was taken into custody for questioning and later released. He has not been publicly identified. Protesters gathered overnight to call for more action. No charges have been filed, but the Manhattan District Attorney's Office said it is under investigation and is a solemn and serious matter. The DA's office also said the investigation is being handled by, quote, senior experienced prosecutors, and they're asking for any witnesses who may have seen something to come forward. Guys, it's important also to note that just ruling something a homicide mm. does not necessarily mean that a crime was committed. Mm. It just mm -hmm. means the death was the responsibility of another person. All right. Mm. Mm. Yep. Very important distinction. Yep. Stephanie Goss, thank you so much. You're welcome. New this morning, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who is already facing criticism for failing to disclose trips paid for by conservative billionaire Harlan Crow, reportedly had school tuition for a relative also paid for by the billionaire. According to a ProPublica report, Justice Thomas sent his teenage grandnephew to a private boarding school in northern Georgia back in 2008. Now, tuition at the school ran to more than $6,000 a month, but Crow reportedly paid. NBC News has not independently confirmed the report. We have reached out to the Supreme Court for comment. In a previous statement to ProPublica, Thomas has called Crow one of his dearest friends and said he understood that he did not have to disclose trips paid for by Crow. Crow says that he has helped other at-risk youth with tuition. In a statement, Crow's office says in part, quote, it's disappointing that those with partisan political interests would try to turn health Helping at risk youth with tuition assistance into something nefarious or political. Now, let's get a check on your morning news now weather forecast. Meteorologist Angie Lassman joins us with an update. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Hope you have some weekend plans that are outdoors because Ooh. in the Northeast, the Midwest, we're going to have some nice conditions. Stunning. Very spring leg. Yeah, stunning. That's a good way to describe it, Savannah. Here, uh, here's what's going on right now. We have a couple of lingering showers that are left over from that same kind of pattern that we've been stuck in for a couple of days. We're still going to have the cooler air in place. We also have a couple showers remaining for the West Coast, places like California, uh, LA, dealing with some rain this morning and we have the potential for some stronger storms to develop as we get into the afternoon hours and even evening hours today and tomorrow in parts of the southern plains and stretching into parts of the south tomorrow. Here's the front that we're going to watch through the day today to bring us some shower activity across the Rockies. We'll deal with some of that into the afternoon hours, but we're also going to see the potential to, for some of these stronger storms to develop from Texas through Oklahoma and into Kansas. Then as we get into tomorrow, these are the couple of areas that we'll watch for strong storms. It does it, last into parts of the Mississippi Valley. We'll also see parts of Texas have a chance to see some of those stronger storms once again. Here's the area that we're watching closely today. It does include Oklahoma City, Wichita Falls, down towards San Antonio and Austin, all included in this. 14 million people under a slight risk of some of these stronger storms. And it, what it means as far as impacts is we're looking for the potential to see some large hail up to two inches in, in size. And that means that baseball size hail will be possible once again tomorrow, same kind of impacts. The tornado threat is low, but it isn't zero, so we'll still keep a close eye on that. But again, it's the hail that we're really going to be watching for into the afternoon hours for your Friday as well. We'll have some rain stretched across uh, parts of the south and into the plains as well, up to an inch in spots like North Platte, we could see. Uh, but the warmer conditions are on the way in a hurry, guys. We're going to eventually be into the 70s and even 80s across the Midwest and Northeast over the next couple of days. Bring it on. Bring it on. Gosh. You're not complaining, are you? No. It's okay? Yeah. It's, it's allowed okay. to be this warm now. Now it is. Okay. Okay. He's making fun of my climate anxiety. Sue me for being worried about everything. <laughs> but it's time now, right? It's, it it's May. It it's it getting is. towards June. Yeah, it's all good. Andrew, thanks for the Don't good worry. news. Don't worry. <laughs> all right, well, coming up on Morning News Now, the coronation of King Charles is just days away, happening, of course, this Saturday. After the break, we've got a closer look at how different this year's celebration will be compared with Queen Elizabeth's 70 years ago, back in 1953. Stick around.
We are now less than two days away from the historic coronation of King Charles III, the last coronation all the way back in 1953 when Elizabeth II was crowned queen. She was just 27 at the time. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons joins us from London. Keir, so much has changed these last 70 years, right? Yeah, really, Joe. And you know what? Eight months ago, I was standing right here with this spectacular view of Westminster Abbey for the Queen's funeral. Then, of course, a time of mourning. Now we have the celebration, the coronation, the tradition, the history. And as you mentioned, nothing changes, but many things will be different. In less than 48 hours, the world will witness pomp and pageantry not seen for seven decades, the coronation of a new British monarch. The ceremony steeped in a thousand years of history. Overnight, rehearsals in and around Westminster Abbey included King Charles and Queen Camilla, as well as William and Kate and their children, George, Charlotte and Louis. A new generation in a centuries-old setting. This was the moment Elizabeth II became queen in 1953. Her then four-year-old, Charles, looking on, but not participating. Seventy years later, the heavy St Edward's crown will rest on her son's head. The priceless crown jewels, transported from the Tower of London, trace back to the 17th and 13th centuries. Crowns are incredibly important symbols of monarchy. St. Edward's crown is the crown that's used for the actual moment of crowning. It's a very heavy gold crown. In 1953, Elizabeth's husband, Philip, was first to pledge his allegiance. Charles' oldest son and heir to the throne, Prince William, will play that role for his father. While on his way to being crowned, King Charles will follow the same royal route as last year, when he walked behind the casket of his late mother. 7,000 British troops will take part, the military promising a stunning spectacle, recognisable by kings and queens past. These guns, forming the royal salute for the king's coronation, were fired for the queen's funeral, the arc of history. As in previous generations, controversy will be close by. Prince Harry will attend, but without his wife Meghan or their children. 70 years ago, Queen Elizabeth's coronation was the first to be televised. Now a monarch will assume the throne in the digital era. And yet the most sacred moment will remain hidden. During the anointing with oil, the king will be shielded from the cameras by an ornate screen. His moment with God as he contemplates his new role in history. Other things, Joe, that never seem to change, there will be some protests, but then, of course, as long as there have been kings and queens, there have been those opposed to kings and queens. The British weather, we're worried, honestly, that there may be some rain on Saturday, so the king may be pleased that two hours of his coronation will take place inside Westminster Abbey there. Very nice of William the Conqueror back in 1066 to begin a ritual that's so great for TV, Joe. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think a lot of folks are going to be watching, <laughs> even if it is a little early here in the States. Kira, thanks so much for that preview. We appreciate it. <laughs> I remember being up for William and Kate's wedding. Did you there do was that? that? Yep, definitely. Yep, there we go. I know. <laughs> All that happens over there, we still like to watch. Now let's go to Claudio, who's over there for international headlines from this morning, starting with a deadly bus crash overnight in Egypt. Yeah, Claudio Lavanga joins us with that in other world news. Claudio, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. Officials in Egypt say that at least 14 people had been killed and 25 others had been injured after a passenger bus crashed into a truck on a highway. Now, according to a local newspaper, an official said the bus slammed into a slow moving truck about to park on the road. Egypt has a poor transportation safety record with thousands of people losing their lives in deadly traffic accidents every year. Let's go to Brazil, where on Wednesday, the home of former President Jair Bolsonaro was raided by the federal police. The operation was part of, of an investigation into a group suspected of adding false vaccine data into the government's COVID database. Federal police said in a statement they were ser serving 16 search and seizure warrants and six preventive arrest warrants in Brasilia and Rio de Janeiro. 
two of Bolsonaro's closest aides are among those arrested in the operation. Now to Kosovo, where workers who grew tired of wasting their own energy to cut the grass around their solar panels decided to hire a new workforce to do the job for them. Twice a week, they take more than 100 sheep and a few goats to graze around the 12,000 photovoltaic panels in a solar farm in eastern Kosovo. As they don't spend any petrol running lawn mowers, they save their own energy and they also save money and they end the environment with it. It doesn't get greener than that, guys. No <laughs> kidding. And the sheep get a there great meal. Go. So there you yeah, go. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Love yep. that. Claudio, thank you. Everybody wins. Exactly. <laughs> Coming up, the latest battle over abortion rights in America taking place in Wisconsin this morning. After the break, we'll dig deeper into a months-old lawsuit that takes aim at the state's pre-Civil War abortion ban and the Republican prosecutor who wants to keep things the way they are. You're watching Morning News Now. The latest abortion battle is playing out in a Wisconsin courtroom today. Oral arguments are scheduled to begin in a lawsuit over Wisconsin's near total abortion ban from the 1800s. It prohibits all abortions except for those needed to save a pregnant woman's life. Wisconsin Attorney General is suing to try to block that ban. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now with more on this. So Danny, we're seeing more and more of these legal battles after Roe versus Wade was overturned. So in this situation, I guess one of the key questions, does the Attorney General, who's a Democrat, have have the legal standing and then what does he need to try and prove here to get this old law thrown off the books? Standing is a fundamental constitutional issue. It asks the question, what business is it of yours to even be here in court? And it's a difficult one and always an issue in abortion cases because constitutionally, who has an interest uh, such that they can bring a lawsuit. You might think, well, anyone who's a potentially pregnant woman should have standing to challenge an abortion law, an abortion law. But that may not be the case because, for example, when it comes to taxpayers, we all have interest in paying taxes. We all pay taxes. But the courts have long said that an individual taxpayer doesn't have standing to challenge tax code or tax regulation. So standing in the abortion cases is always a hot issue. And I'll tell you, courts love to throw cases out based on standing uh, because it means they don't have to do any work. And in this case, the issue will be whether or not the attorney general, does he have standing, constitutional standing, in order to bring this lawsuit? Does he have a concrete interest in the outcome? Of course, everyone has an interest in abortion legislation, but that's not the same as constitutional standing. And I think that'll be an issue before the court. Let's talk about what the current ban says, though, and what it means. So it's it allows for life-saving abortions. Isn't that kind of, isn't there room there to open to interpretation? How can that be decided? Who gets to say this is life-saving, this is not? And if somebody disagrees, could a medical care provider be gone after for that? Yes and no. The definition of what is life-saving will be a medical definition, but the effects of that are not so much legal and won't uh -huh. be discussed in court. It'll be about a, a chilling effect on providers. Providers right. have and will be afraid to wade into that morass of what is and what is not medically necessary, mm. because guess who's personally responsible? Legally, it'll be mm. the provider, and the provider could face criminal charges. So if I'm a provider, I don't blame them. I would rather err on the side of caution and not uh, perform an abortion if I don't know if it's medically necessary, rather than perform the abortion and just hope that my determination of what is medically necessary holds up in court. Look, people are, I don't blame them. They're self-interested. Nobody wants a criminal case. Uh, it's something that every provider will be thinking about. All right. And a good chance this will end up before the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Too. That's right. All right, Danny, thank you so much. A big change in the weight loss industry. After four decades, the iconic weight loss brand Jenny Craig announced it will be shutting down after not being able to secure funding. The news comes as the diet and nutrition industry has been hit with increasing competition from new medications being used to help people lose weight, like the ones on your screen, Ozempic, Wagovi. Well, NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us now with more on this. Hey, Emily, good morning. Good morning to you. For years, brands like Jenny Craig, Atkins, Slim Fast were the go-to options for losing weight. But now, the business model of meal plans and counting calories is being forced to grapple with a rapidly growing new trend in weight loss. And while Jenny Craig has struggled with the industry's seismic shift, some of the biggest names you know are already on board. And you think, one day I will fit into that dress. For decades, Jenny Craig has been a household name in weight loss with celebrity endorsers like Valerie Bertinelli. 
I lost 18 pounds in just seven weeks. And Mariah Carey. Jenny gets results. All touting the brand's prepared meals, diet plans, and in-person coaching. You look great! But now, after 40 years, the company is closing its doors for good. In a termination letter obtained by NBC News and sent to employees, the company says after searching for a buyer, it was unable to secure additional financing. Hourly employees were let go Tuesday, and the last day for salaried workers will be Friday, according to the letter. Customers anticipating meal deliveries left scrambling, flooding Jenny Craig's Facebook page with complaints. One writing, I paid for my food and never received it. Jenny Craig did not respond to our requests for comment. The company struggles, just one sign of a seismic shift in the $75 billion diet industry. Fueled by inflation, cutting into budgets, free online options, and a new class of weight loss and diabetes drugs like Wagovi, Mongero, and Ozempic, widely popularized on social media. Baby, the hype is real. This new class of drugs out there could potentially have a big impact going forward. I think it's going to be a lot harder for these companies to, to keep brick and mortar centers uh, open. Facing membership decline, Weight Watchers recently purchased Sequence a company that offers telehealth visits with doctors to prescribe some weight loss drugs known to suppress users' appetites. The company plans to create a specific program for members using them. We can give proper information to the masses about the appropriate use of these medications. Noom was different for her. because he Noom, a fitness and nutrition app, has also that. reportedly launched a plan offering the popular drugs to clients if they qualify. NBC News reached out to Noom for comment but has not heard back, telling the Wall Street Journal the program is in pilot mode, saying, we feel treating weight loss from a medical standpoint is a natural complement to Noom's behavioral change tool as the world of weight loss and wellness undergoes a major shakeup. So while you may be hearing a lot about drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi, medical experts caution they're not designed for cosmetic use and not for everyone. Ozempic isn't approved by the FDA to treat obesity, and while Wagovi is, it's still a serious drug that can have unpleasant side effects like nausea. So, of course, it's always important to consult your doctor first. Gosh, so interesting how quickly that has just totally changed the industry. Absolutely. A lot people, of buzz around this. Yeah, you'd think people would be more afraid of that versus just, you know, dieting or something like that. It's interesting. You know, dieting's hard, though. Yeah, yeah. Right. very. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Staying on industry shakeups, coming up, another shocking retailer shut down on the West Coast. This time it's Nordstrom shuttering both of its stores in downtown San Francisco. But it's not just money that's making the company pack its bags. We'll explain after this. Welcome back. This morning, mega retailer Nordstrom announcing plans to close not one, but two stores in a major U.S. city. Downtown San Francisco stores will shutter their doors in just a few months. Nordstrom cited so-called changing dynamics, and the city has struggled with crime. Now other retailers may soon be following in their steps. National correspondent Miguel Almaguer joins us now on this from San Francisco. After 35 years, Nordstrom's is calling it quits and packing its bags, deciding to leave San Francisco. That decision putting the city's response to the pandemic in the spotlight and its response to crime. It's a shocking shutdown for one of the country's leading retailers. Nordstrom announcing it'll close its two locations in downtown San Francisco by the end of August. A company exec writing the area's dynamics have changed dramatically, impacting customer foot traffic and our ability to operate successfully. It's too bad they're leaving. Nordstrom, one of more than a dozen stores that have or plan to close their downtown locations since 2020, including including DSW, Marshalls, and The Gap. Whole Foods temporarily shuttering its flagship location, citing concerns over employee safety. The mask move out comes as the once bustling city center has emptied amid the rise in remote work and the intensified scrutiny over the city's response to crime. Industry experts say both issues are causing store closures nationwide. Lack of foot traffic has to be the leading cause of it. But I would say theft and other crime-related issues are probably really close behind. In San Francisco, theft is on the rise, but the number of reported incidents is not at an all-time high, although the National Retail Federation says its members have been discouraged from reporting retail crime. Police have been telling them, don't report these thefts. We've got other fish to fry. The numbers don't reflect the reality of what's happening. 
The NRF estimates theft is costing businesses nationwide 95 to 100 billion dollars a year. After a string of smash and grab robberies rocked retailers across the country, including these shocking scenes in San Francisco, Walmart's CEO warned retail crime was cutting into its bottom line. Theft is an issue. If that's not corrected over time, prices will be higher right. and or stores will close. Months later, the big box giant announced it would shutter 19 locations this year, saying many were simply not profitable. Amid this major move out of downtown San Francisco, the city says it's trying to revitalize this area and attract businesses in just as they're leaving. Back to you. All right, Miguel, thank you so much. More financial headlines now. Bloomberg reporting that workers at a unionized Apple store in Maryland are making themselves heard. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us on that and more. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good to see you. So, yeah, workers at Apple's unionized store in Maryland are making their demands. Bloomberg reports it's in talks with the company this week. They're asking for higher pay and more time off. They're also seeking changes that could impact Apple's tightly controlled retail experience, such as letting customers tip employees. Now, those could be in increments of 3%, 5%, or a custom amount for in-store credit card transactions. And the store near Baltimore is the first Apple retail location in the U.S. to unionize, but efforts elsewhere haven't been as successful. Microsoft is making its AI-powered Bing chatbot available to everyone starting today with no more waiting list. All you have to do is sign into Bing or Edge with your Microsoft account and you can access the open preview version of Bing GPT-4. Microsoft has also upgraded the tool with several new features including video and image results, persistent chat and history, and plugin support. And Gmail now has blue check marks too. So Google says that companies that have verified their identity will automatically receive the logo to use with their brand profile. The feature is designed to help users figure out whether emails are from a legitimate source or a scammer. Gmail has started rolling out verified check marks across both workspace and personal Google accounts, guys. Interesting. Yeah. I, I'm stunned at the stuff that gets through my spam. Oh, my folders. gosh. So I'm like, wait, how did that get cool. through? Yeah. Mine's a mess. <laughs> yeah. My email is like 40,000 unread or something. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. work on that. Yeah. This yeah. Wait till you right. see how many texts and voicemails. It's a mess. <laughs> oh, <Savannah. my> God. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Now to one young boy's incredible story of survival and resilience. Last 4th of July, a gunman opened fire on a parade in Illinois, killing seven people and injuring 48 others. Eight-year-old Cooper Roberts survived but was left paralyzed. But he is not letting that slow him down. NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas sat down with Cooper and his mom and brings us their story. Hey there, you're about to meet a family that says they were probably a lot like your family at home watching the news as spectators until they were thrust into something far too many Americans are going through these days. They're speaking out for the first time because they want to make sure these events are not forgotten because it changed their son, their family, and they hope it changes the country. You still have shrapnel in your leg. A lot. Do you feel that every day? I do. Yep. Mom, Keely Roberts has scars she's not afraid to show, but it's the ones you can't see that hurt the most. I think about the family that went to the parade that day, and that family's gone. Last July 4th, the Roberts family set out for their hometown parade in Highland Park, just outside of Chicago. But as families lined the street that morning, a gunman using an AR-15 style rifle started firing, killing seven and injuring dozens, including Keeley and, and also her son Cooper, just eight years old. It was very clear in my mind at that time that Cooper was very likely not going to survive. A bullet hit Cooper in the back, severing his spine. His mother says with the help of incredible doctors, Cooper somehow pulled through, paralyzed, but alive. Everything changes from as a family with little kids from something as simple as where juice boxes have to go in the in the refrigerator, right? How do you get them up the stairs? Right, how do you get them up the stairs? Um, we don't have um, an accessible home that way right now. But Keeley says though her son's body changed, he did not. Cooper is kind and loving and empathetic and caring. And that is exactly who we met on a sunny day 
near Lake Michigan. What did you guys think? I loved it. It was like probably my favorite. I'm not going to say any spoilers. Who's Cooper talking to me about the Super Mario Brothers movie? Think of all the other games. And right next to him, his twin brother Luke, the two rolling side by side. Luke has started to ride his scooter all the time. It's something that Keeley says has inspired her. I watch how desperately he loves his brother. Luke will always be a bit of a guard dog for Cooper. And the inspiration doesn't stop there. The little boy who had been through so much, swimming again on his own. That's what it looks like to be eight and to fight for your life. That's what it looks like. And Cooper's family is fighting back as well. They've joined a legal effort to hold accountable those they say are responsible for the bloodshed, including the gun manufacturer. Their attorney believes the company and others are liable. Can you promise them justice? Well, what we have promised them is accountability. And what we have promised them is that we will do everything in our power to ensure that there is some form of justice. It's just a part of the Roberts family fight, seeking justice, but also a miracle, hoping science finds a way for Cooper to walk again. I push my chips all in on that little boy. I believe in him, but I also believe in this country. We solve problems. We do what is not possible. The Roberts family has received thousands of letters, packages, mementos from people all over the country. Keeley told me she reads every single letter. A lot of them are from other parents who have suffered some type of trauma. But she says it has helped her and that it's been transformational to connect with all these mom and dads all across the country. Back to you. All right, Tom, thank you so much. We wish that family the best. Absolutely. Coming up, a welcome sigh of relief for fans of Jamie Foxx. After that mysterious medical emergency last month, Foxx is now breaking his silence on social media. His message to fans after this. Welcome back, and to all who celebrate, may the 4th be with you. Yes, today is May 4th, Star Wars Day, and today we'll see Carrie Fisher finally get a star posthumously on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Fisher, who died in 2016, of course, played Princess Leia in the movies. She joins Harrison Ford and Mark Hamill, who already have stars. The induction ceremony will be held at 2.30 Eastern Time and will be live-streamed by the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. Well-deserved. Yes, absolutely well-deserved. That's amazing. Also, I've already been seeing lots of those. May the 4th be with you on my Instagram. It's Savannah. <laughs> May the 4th be with you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. I appreciate that. Well, an encouraging update today on the health of Oscar-winning actor Jamie Foxx. Foxx has taken to social media for the first time since he suffered an undisclosed medical emergency last month. NBC News correspondent Jacob Sobroff has the latest. Hey there, Jamie Foxx has posted an update on social media, his first in suffering an unspecified medical emergency last month. And though we still don't know all that much about his health scare, yesterday's short Instagram message really was a relief to many. Jamie Foxx sending a message to fans for the first time since suffering an unknown medical emergency several weeks ago. The actor writing on Instagram, appreciate all the love, feeling blessed. That short message coming just weeks after Fox was hospitalized for an unidentified medical complication in April. At the time, Fox's daughter, Corinne, writing, due to quick action and great care, he's already on the way to recovery. We know how beloved he is and appreciate your prayers. Fox had been filming the Netflix movie Back in Action alongside Cameron Diaz. Mess around. Everybody do the mess around. The 55-year-old who won an Oscar for his leading role in Ray is also a Grammy Award winner thanks to his singing talents. The usual. Tonight we getting unpredictable. I love Fox's music skills showcased on Beat Shazam, which the Hollywood star co-hosts with his daughter. Yes. I told you how thankful I am for everything you've done for me. Wednesday, Fox Entertainment announced the duo will be stepping aside from the game show this season, with Nick Cannon filling in as guest host. Fox reposting the update, expressing gratitude, adding, see you all soon. This week, comedian Kevin Hart giving an update on his friend. The dope thing is that he's getting better in this situation. I don't know the details, but to my knowledge, is there is a, a lot of progression and the world a better man. One of many celebrities sending Fox their support. Keenan Thompson saying, yes, take all the time you need, bro. 
and Mary J. Blige commenting, love you, Jamie. We reached out to Jamie Foxx's team for comment overnight, but we didn't hear back. Back to you. All right, Jacob Soboroff, thank you so much. We wish him the best. That does mm -hmm. it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stick with us. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.